These ones are chanterelles also, but they're white chanterelles. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah but so, but the again, gills, you see the yeah. gills come down the stem quite a yeah. ways. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you'll experience that because you'll pick some of these today. So. These ones, uh, technically called sparasis, are other uh, commonly called, what do they look like? Cauliflower fungus. fungus. Yes, yeah. cauliflower yeah. fungus. Yeah. And um, they're kind of a special mushroom. When you see one of these in the woods, it's like, ooh, uh, wow. So these ones are actually a really delicious mushroom, and they're one of the few boletes that you'll see growing on usually hemlock stumps or, or, or rotted logs or something. Or if it's not, if it looks like it's coming out of the ground, it's probably a piece of rotted wood under the ground. And this one here is a type of russula. Uh, the reason I picked it is because this is the mushroom that another mushroom called the lobster mushroom cannibalizes and grows on. Uh, but you would never know it because when you see the lobster mushroom, this has been totally dissolved. In. And they say with lobster mushrooms you should know what it grows on, but the fact of the matter is you have no way of knowing. So when we go out as a group, we try and stay somewhat together. Um, it's not a contest. We help each other. When we get back, we'll take the mushrooms that we pick and uh, Brad will give everybody some of the mushrooms. So, um, and we'll be eating some of them. This is a rosy gumphidius, and it has a slimy cap. It's one of the characteristics. And it is an edible mushroom. But anyway, before you eat it, you can just... Uh, you have to take that off? Yeah, you, yeah, because it would have not a very nice texture. Gently pull away the moss. Yes, it's growing under a little bit of a root there. And I just cut it flush with the ground. I have no diseases. We're looking at a lobster mushroom. It, normally lobster mushrooms are bright orange or they turn red as they get older, but this, for some reason, is, uh, well, it's not red, <laughs> but it is a lobster mushroom. So we can take it back to the restaurant and, uh, and maybe get to try a little slice. So uh, pretty much, as you can see, we did really well here. A good uh, variety of mushrooms. And uh, so what I want to do is just go over cleaning them. And as we were talking, we were walking out there, cleaning them before you get them into your basket is definitely uh, a start. And once you get them home, you're going to need to put some finishing touches on them. All I like to use is a pastry brush um, or a clean paint brush that you haven't painted your house with. Um, <laughs> is definitely one that you want to use. And when they're a little more moist, they're hard. it's a little harder to brush them. And just brush them right up. We can try, though. What I usually do is you can wring them out just like this and typically the mushroom when it's not this soft comes back <laughs> this one not as much but you see it came back actually pretty good and sometimes like I've a ton of water out of them and then you know so you're getting a lot of the moisture up and at this time what you'd want to do with it is get some newsprint and put it on like a cookie sheet or on a tray and just lay the mushrooms on to dry not dry like you're going to dehydrate them but just to dry out so this one is a, a fairly small one, so we could actually use the stem, but if it was a larger one, you'd want to trim the stem off. And the nice part about trimming the stem off is that's when you can see if there's any worms in it, because they usually have all the little holes in there. And then you just want to trim the sponge off just a bit. So right around it. Like so. Now, could you eat it? Probably. It's not going to hurt you, but the to the, the texture of it, the, you know, even the, the flavor of it. What you want is that nice meat inside is what you're going after. And at this point, all you would do is 
don't you get all that out of there? Just chop it all up. And sometimes when they get bigger, the caps you want to peel to. This guy, I wouldn't. I wouldn't really bother with. You can. A lot of people say you can just treat it almost like you would pasta, and steam it. And you can put any sauce that you would put over a pasta or a rice dish. What I like to do, and uh, we'll do a little bit for lunch, is I like to steam in a little bit of stock, chicken stock, vegetable stock, and then make a brown butter and thyme sauce and just put it right over the top. So really all that's doing is accentuating the flavor of the mushroom and not really hiding it. This one you'd also want to peel the top because it's that velvety. Okay, so these are the mushrooms that I just sauteed up, hot, hot pan, a little bit of, uh, uh, I use vegetable oil, canola, you can use an olive oil, but I always tell people if you're going to cook, please don't use extra virgin olive oil, it's really expensive, and as soon as it hits the pan, you've just made olive oil, you've just really ruined all that nice press, that first press that they do, so I always say use a regular olive oil, straight, you know, second press, third press olive oil is fine. So, we have the what I like to call the quintessential bistro dish, chanterelles on toast. It doesn't get any more French bistro than that. Sometimes the weather cooperates. We had a little bit of rain today, so it's kind of hardy to warm you up, and that's the idea of this dish. And uh, it's pretty simply done, just a couple simple ingredients. And the same thing, hot, hot pan. I can't stress that enough. And then uh, we take and we put the chanterelles in there first. So then we just uh, um, saute those up. Then we add some garlic and onions. And the reason we don't add the garlic and onions first is it would burn because it has heat of the pan. So we add that secondary. Right after, it only takes a second because that pan is still quite hot, a little bit of white wine. Reduce that by half so it kind of starts to get almost like a glazy, a little syrupy in the pan. And then some brandy and just flambe it with some brandy. And then after that, when that reduces down, uh, just a little bit of cream. Okay, a lot of bit of cream, but it tastes good. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then we uh, a little bit of fresh thyme out of the garden, and uh, some salt and pepper, and we use uh, some of the local salt from uh, Vancouver Island Salt Company. For anyone that doesn't know, we produce salt here on Vancouver Island now, uh, right in the Cobble Hill area, actually, uh, going out towards Cherry Point. And uh, so then, with the end of that one unfortunate local ingredient that we don't have that I do like to cook with, and you probably can smell it, is a little bit of truffle oil. Again, truffle oil works like your extra virgin olive oil. You don't want to heat it up. So actually, as soon as you heat it up, that truffle smell actually flavors go all the way. So you just use it as a finishing. So bon appetit. So we have a, a melange, we should call it, I guess, here. A whole assortment of different mushrooms in this dish. So I took everything that we found today and made it really into a stew or what we call a ragu. And uh, ragu is really simply a thick sauce, stew-like. And uh, cooked it all down, same thing, the hot heat. And uh, with this one I added um, a bit of chicken stock and uh, white wine of course, let that cook all down. And then the onions and garlic are in there too. And then we add a little bit of mustard, grainy mustard, I love cooking with mustard. And uh, just a touch of uh, lemon zest too. The nice thing about mustards, lemon zest, vinegar is if you're trying to cut any salt out of your diet, um, you can add those, and those actually help to enhance your food flavor instead of just keep dumping salt on stuff. So I really like to do that to try to keep the salt down anyway in a dish, because salt sometimes can get really overpowering. So I use a lot of other flavor enhancers. And uh, then we also uh, mixed in there just a little bit of lovage. Uh, from, if everybody's not familiar with lovage, but lovage uh, looks like a celery leaf, has a very similar taste, but very, very intense, and it grows uh, locally here too. And then of course some soft, soft polenta, so some stock again, you can use vegetable stock, chicken stock, you could use water and a little bit of cornmeal and you stir that all together and uh, keep cooking that. And yes, you're all saying no cream. Well, there's a little bit of butter in the... I had to. I had
It's a cheese, it's, a, it's actually a very, it's like a Greer style cheese. It's from Little Qualicum. Um, they named it after Rath Trevor area of uh, the top of the island. The cauliflower mushroom, and as I was explaining before, I just steamed that downstairs and, uh, and just a little tiny bit of, uh, I use vegetable stock, you could use a chicken stock. Six, seven minutes, eight minutes, it depends on the size of the mushroom. And then I make a little brown butter, brunoisette as the French would like to call it. So all you do is take the whole butter, put it in a pan, and you just melt it down and keep cooking it down until all the milk solids start to brown and caramelize. Well, we'll have to let me know if we did it or not. This is the first time I've ever made a mushroom dessert. <laughs> <laughs> I figured, well, people do carrot and zucchini cake, and so we can, we can get there. And I've used some tomatoes in dessert even before. And the cake was, was like I mentioned before, that you know, a carrot zucchini cake, in a way, kind of a play on that with uh, some different spices in there. And uh, we actually used uh, local durum flour in there as well. And of course some eggs. So pretty much a, a very similar spice cake. And then we folded in uh, um, chanterelle uh, mushrooms again. And also a little bit of sweet potato. And uh, the sweet potato actually codes, comes from uh, Code's Farm, if Denise hasn't shared on the, uh, on the end here or not, but she and her husband have a uh, magnificent farm here in the Cowichan Valley that supply us with, well, anything from sweet potatoes right on through to emu meat. You don't want to overmix, you just want to mix till everything comes together. If you're going to mix it too much, you're going to start to develop the gluten in the flour, and then you have a really tough, uh, firm, uh, almost cookie-like uh, consistency instead of cake. So that looks nice, come together well. I like to use the flex molds, as you can see, it's just like a rubber mat, and you can crinkle it up to almost nothing. The great part about that is, is once the cakes have baked and set up, you just pop them right out. So just a nice spoonful in. And the flex molds, you don't really even need to oil. Um, you can see how flexible, obviously, they are. And being made out of the, the silicone um, rubber there, they, uh, they pop right out. And I've had a different variety of different kinds of ice cream, but this ice cream today, what we've done is make a standard ice cream base uh, with some cream, some eggs, um, super low calorie. And um, then we actually swirled in a little bit of uh, caramel that we've infused uh, truffle into, uh, the truffle essence into the caramel, and we've swirled that into the ice cream just as it starts getting done spinning. And then I took some chanterelle mushrooms and sauteed them up um, so they're almost crispy. And then I chopped them up really fine, and we spun those into the ice cream as well and let that uh, set overnight. And then on top of it, we have the jelly tooth fungus. And uh, we just quick, quick candied them. What would be nice actually when you have a lot of time is to candy them and let them sit for a little while and dry. And you'll get that little bit of crunch off the sugar and then the, the gumminess, like a gummy bear. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. Huh?